So we should probably get started. I've, I've given the, the, the standard uh, delay plus a little extra for the sunshine outside. Um, sure, here. Okay. <laughs> I've never seen someone do that at a seminar, but okay. Um, so today's uh, seminar is by uh, Bill Gay. He's going to talk about uh, a bunch of his work that he's been doing. He's this close to being done. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think you'll appreciate this. This is a lot about what happens when you push robots out into the real world and uh, what do you have to think about when you're, when you're going to do that. Because like it or not, people are going to perceive robots for having characteristics that we may not have intentionally designed into them. Um, if you're curious about this sort of, at least the first half of your work, um, there's actually a course. It'll be in its second year this fall uh, about a... a uh, ethnography of uh, the Robotics Institute. I'm the instructor. Um, the number is changing, but uh, just look for Qualt Ethnography. And it's about, it's, it's in the context of quality of life technologies, but the skills and lessons we're teaching are translatable to other, other uh, areas as well. Anyway, without further ado. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Gemutlu. I'm really this close to finishing my PhD at the Human Computer Interaction Institute. Um, today I'll be presenting my work on designing social behavior for human-like robots. And before I start my talk, um, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that this work was done at two institutions, here at Carnegie Mellon and also at ATR in Japan, uh, with the help of my collaborators, Jody Ford, Lisa Jeskoch, and Sarah Kiesler at Carnegie Mellon, and Hiroshi Shiguro and Takaki Kanda at ATR. So the research space that I'm interested in is systems that embody human physical, cognitive, and social capabilities. A variety of systems fall into the, the space from applications such as the, the hospital delivery robot that you see on the left, which doesn't necessarily have physical human-like capabilities in appearance, but has behavioral human-like capabilities, such as freely navigating in hallways or using speech. Um, and to systems that are more sophisticated robots with bipad locomotion, or um, robots that are extremely lifelike, such as this android on the right. Some of these applications are currently being used uh, in, in the world, carrying out mundane tasks in organizations, such as making deliveries at hospitals. Uh, for, for instance, this, this hospital robot um, up on the left is used, uh, used in about 100 hospitals in the US. And there are more than 200 robots total. And some of the applications are envisioned uh, for five to, two, five, five to 10 years from now. These are systems that will carry out informational tasks, such as monitoring children or providing assistance in a car. And finally, some applications are considered for uh, far out, perhaps 30 years from now. And these robots will carry out social and physical tasks that require human dexterity and more sophisticated social capabilities, such as situational awareness. The questions that I'm interested in in the, the research space that these applications create are, what are people's mental models of these systems? What kind of expectations do they create in people? And how can we design their interaction with people so that they meet these expectations? Okay. So following these questions, the, the two threads, the two parts of my research look at how can we understand more about people's expectations and responses to robots through observing their real world interactions with them? And how can we design future products to meet these expectations and deliver the social and cognitive benefits that, that they promise um, in the future? So in this talk, I'll be giving you an overview of both uh, bodies of work. In the first part of the talk, I'll present an ethnographic study of a hospital delivery robot uh, to, that we conducted to understand some of the expectations that the robot uh, created in, in, in the people who use the robot. And the second part of the talk, um, I'll present a process that I adapted to design behaviors for, for robots uh, to meet these expectations and demonstrate how this process could be used to design behaviors for particular design problems. Okay? So I'll start with the first part about understanding expectations. The approach that I take in trying to understand what people expect from these systems is through conducting long-term ethnographic studies in the actual context of use. And the goal of these studies is to build substantive explanatory theory 
on how real-world factors, such as organizational, social, and environmental factors, affect the way people perceive and work with robotic technology. The outcome of this work will serve first as a founding basis to build more refined theory uh, about interaction between technology and people, and second as guidelines for designing robotic technology for the real world. So in this research, uh, we might be informed and guided by a number of existing research areas. One of them is um, an area looked at, that looked at technology's impact on how organizations are formed, how they work, and the products and services that they create. While these theories inform us on technology's impact on organizations in general, how robots might impact these structures is still unknown. And this is a different piece of technology, and their impact might be different. Also, these theories are um, not informative as to how to design the technology to maximize its positive impact. Work in uh, human-computer interaction uh, also try to address this problem through looking at how cultural, social, and political factors could shape the design of this technology. Although, how much of these implications would carry over from uh, computer systems to the design of robots is still unknown. On the other hand, um, there is a small number of very promising studies in human-robot interaction that have looked at how robotic products might be situated in hospitals and the home, focusing on how people make sense of this technology. These are early work, but we could actually use some of the knowledge created by them. So toward constructing this theoretical understanding, uh, I conducted an ethnographic study of how people use, interact with, and perceive robots in a hospital and how the introduction of the robot affected their work practices um, in the hospital. So I conducted this study at two research sites over a 15-month period. The first site was the headquarters of Atheon, uh, the manufacturer of the hospital delivery robot. And the second site was a women's uh, universal hospital that used seven of the robots uh, that the company produced. So before I pr proceed with the research, um, I'd like to show you a video of the robot and explain to you what uh, it entails. So the company's product, called Tug, is an autonomous mobile robot that moves from one unit uh, to another within the hospital making deliveries. For example, it delivers medicine from the pharmacy to patient care units or empty food trays from patient care units back to the kitchen. The robot has two human-like capabilities, navigation and speech. It navigates around the hospital autonomously, uses doors and elevators, and makes announcements of, to inform users of its actions and uh, when it requires people's attention. Human interaction is done uh, with the robot through a web-based interface, either at nurses' computers or on a touchscreen monitor at the robot space station, and through the two red and green buttons that are located on top of the robot. With the um, deliveries, senders use the computer interface to request a robot for an immediate task, place a delivery in the robot, and use the buttons on, on the robot to initiate the delivery. that you see there. And when the robot reaches its destination, it makes announcements to inform the receiver. And the receiver then uh, picks up the delivery and sends the robot back to its base station. So as I mentioned earlier, our, our data collection followed the methods and techniques of an ethnography. Here I'd like to uh, briefly describe these methods. Uh, one of these methods was participant observation. The goal of this method is to gain an intimate familiarity with the social context that the robot was developed in. What were the designers thinking? What were their decisions informed by? And so on. So on. We work closely with the company, joining meetings, conducting interviews, and help field teams install new robots or train users. We also conducted fly-on-the-wall observations to observe the environment, social interactions, and social, political, and workflow structures in their natural context. For instance, through following the robot at the hospital from a distance as it made deliveries uh, between two units and, and observing uh, people's interactions with the robot and with each other as, as the delivery happens. We also conducted semi-structured interviews to deepen our understanding of the experiences of people uh, working on and interacting with the robot on a day-to-day -day basis. 
This produced more than 500 pages of field notes and uh, interview transcripts. And we used a grounded theory method to analyze this data. And um, I'll spend a few minutes to explain what this methodology involves. Okay. So grounded theory analysis is a process of open coding, selective coding, comparative analysis, and theory building. And I'll go through each step to give you examples of how data is handled at each step and why we do this. Okay. The first step uh, of our analysis um, was a process called open coding or marking, where we look at transcripts or interviews um, or, or field notes and identify or, or mark for conceptual codes or markers that are representative of events, objects, relationships, and interactions that seem to be significant in the data. So let's look at an example. Here, an informant says, I kicked it before, talking about the robot, and told not to when it first came. In identifying the underlying concept, we ask ourselves the question of, what's going on here? Okay. So the answer is that the informant is uh, talking about, in a way, abusing the robot due to frustration with, with his functionality. We then mark the segment with the code abusing the robot. Okay. The next step involved categorizing these concepts into explanations of arising phenomena that are repeated patterns of events, actions, and interactions that represent people's responses to the problems and situations uh, that they encounter in the social environment. Uh, for instance, uh, as we look at the data, we see other forms of mistreatments of the robot, such as yelling at the robot, naming names, and so on. So we can categorize these concepts uh, under a category called negative treatments of the robot. Okay. And the last step of coding, um, we integrate our, our categories into a central paradigm that explains um, the conditions of the social context, actions and uh, people's actions and interactions, and uh, the long-term consequences of these actions and interactions. So the goal of this uh, step is to assemble a big picture of the findings and outline a theoretical model. So here you see the conditions could be that the, 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 this unit has high workload and people, uh, people's work is always inter interrupted and in conclusions they treat the robot negatively. Okay, it's a sort of a simple model. So far we try to abstract out uh, concepts and identify phenomena through building connections connection between concepts. And the next step in the process is comparative analysis where we we go back in the data and use our conceptual categories to make comparisons in the data across different dimensions. For instance, we can c compare transcripts from male participants to female participants or uh, data from different parts of the hospital and so on. Okay. Oh, and this is how it looks. Um, what you're seeing here is what we take the perceptions of the robot category and look back at the data to see how different um, sets of data differ in this particular concept. Okay. And in the last step in our analysis, uh, we create a theoretical model uh, that used um, existing research that I cited earlier, the background, as a basis to explain uh, the findings in our data. So in this example, um, it's a sim simple uh, model building associations to describe how different levels of workload might lead to different perceptions of the robot. Okay. So um, <clears throat> as I go through this process, I'll be building this model uh, and inform that with the, with the findings we had, we had in the data. OK. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk about the findings now. Our data showed, three ki showed that three kinds of units used the robot. So one of them was medical units, consisting of surgical and oncology departments, where patients are either prepared for inpatient procedures or are recovering from surgery. So the units, by unit, I mean the patient rooms, the nurses' stations, staff rooms, and, and supply cabinets. This is sort of a uh, physical and people uh, system. Another kind of unit was postpartum units where new mothers recover after they deliver their babies. And the outline of these units were very similar um, to the medical units uh, with the addition of a newborn unit, a newborn room in the, in the unit. The last kind of units we observed was uh, support units, including central processing, uh, where they prepare all the surgical materials and, and do the uh, sterilization and so on. So pharmacy, kitchen, uh, where they do the linens, uh, post office, and so on. Okay. Our analysis showed 
strong differences between uh, medical units and postpartum units in how they perceived, interacted with, and used the robots due to differences in workflow, political, social and emotional, and environmental factors. Here, workflow factors refer, refer to people's work practices, their workload, and levels of interruptibility. Political factors represent the values, goals, interests, and expectations that the members of units had about their work. Social and emotional factors describe the social structure and the emotional tone of the relationships among these people. And lastly, environmental factors uh, describe how physical environment was, was, was used by these units. So in presenting these results, I'll be going through each category and construct the theoretical model that I uh, talked about before. Okay. The introduction of the robots changed the way people worked in the overall hospital organization. Before, the robot deliveries were made by people. For instance, dirty linen was uh, picked up by people from the linen department as they made rounds at the units, picking up the linen left in front of patient rooms. With the introduction of the robot, people at the linen department started sending the robot uh, to patient units, and nurses or assistants at the units loaded the linen on the robot, and the robot took the linen back to the linen department. So we observed that this change in workflow greatly benefited the linen department although it created additional work for the medical and postpartum units. Okay. Here's an excerpt from an interview from the medical unit, and the informant is describing this change as a displacement of work from the support units to the medical unit. Okay. Although what was interesting in our findings is that this additional work created burden for medical units, but it didn't for the postpartum units. So here are two excerpts from, um, from one of the interviews from a medical unit and one from a postpartum unit. Uh, the one from the medical unit talks about, the top one, talks about how it's actually not the robot helping her, it's her uh, helping the robot. Right. On the other hand, the informant from the postpartum unit describes the robot as a big help. And uh, you can see these differences, these, these contrasts across the, uh, across the data. So in our comparative analysis, we compared uh, our data along a variety of dimensions. Um, however, medical units and postpartum units had no strong differences in their organizational and physical structures. So they had the same number of nurses, similar in age, uh, gender and education, and uh, same number of beds, and almost identical floor plans. When we went, uh, we then went back to the site for more observations and interviews to probe the causes for the difference in people's perceptions and uses of the robot. Our analysis of the data showed that the main difference were in the profile of the patients that these units served. Okay. So in the transcript, this uh, unit uh, director is talking about how the two units deliver very different care. Postpartum units care for well people while medical units care for people who are very sick, meaning cancer patients who, uh, or people who just had inpatient procedures who might be spending a long time at the hospital. Okay, okay. so at this point, um, I'd like to start building that theoretical model with the findings so far. We found that uh, the units differed mainly in their patient profile, therefore we place patient profile as a starting point for our model. Um, and start to looking at sort of workflow factors and how they affected the, uh, the perceptions. At medical units, patients' conditions required frequent tests, analysis, and often, often repeated procedures. So nurses and assistants frequently took patients to other units for these additional procedures. These, uh, this aspect of the workflow interrupted them from their regular activities at the units, such as housekeeping, and required them to leave their units uh, on a regular basis. Therefore, when, we, when the robot needed the people's attention, they perceived it negatively affecting, they perceived it as ne negatively affecting their workflow, interrupting them from their more urgent activities. So you can see in this excerpt, the informant is talking about how workers at postpartum units mostly stay at the unit and can attend to the robot when it makes deliveries. On the other hand, workers at medical units are constantly interrupted because they have to do other things such as transporting patients or doing supplies, meaning organizing and so on. So. So we can add this in our uh, model now. We find that the differences in patient profile lead to differences in, uh, in units' work practices and people's workload. 
When the workload was high, interruptions by the robot was perceived to have a negative effect on the workflow. On the other hand, when the, uh, in the workload was low, people could uh, accommodate these interruptions and perceive the robot as improving their workflow. Okay. The next set of um, factors uh, is about po political factors that affected the use of the robot. As I mentioned earlier, the introduction of the robots benefited the support units greatly and improved the overall efficiency of the hospital, although um, it negatively affected the quality of service at the medical units. So here the informant is describing how patients started rating them lower in the cleanliness of their rooms because when nurses are away or engaged with other activities, they can't load the linen to the robot, in which case the robot leaves with the, the unit without taking the linen, and the linen is left lying on the floor, and uh, people are rating the hospital as, as more negatively. Okay. That the robot greatly benefited the hospital but negatively affected the, the quality of service at the medical units uh, created a conflict of interest between the hospital management and the medical units. So this conflict of interest resulted in people resisting to use the robot at these units. So here a unit director is talking about how she sees the robot as adding work on their unit and negatively affecting the quality of service that they deliver, so she is not encouraging her staff to use the robot. Okay, so now we can add these uh, set of findings in the model too. We found that the differences in patient profile led to differences in how much the robot benefited the units. Uh, with the, when the benefit was high, people easily accepted the, using the robot. And when benefit was low, uh, people rejected the use of the robot. In addition to the workflow and political differences, we observed differences in the social and emotional relationships uh, between caregivers and patients um, across units. So in this excerpt, a nurse is talking about how oncology nurses are so in tune with their patients who are often terminally ill. And this close relationship and need for spatial care for medical, medical patients required caregivers to spend more time with these patients and created more workload and, and a more hectic work environment at the nurse's stations. So in this excerpt, um, and the one, the one at the top, uh, a unit, unit secretary is talking about how annoying the robot gets when she's on the phone, there are 15 things going on, and the robot is repeatedly making announcements asking the secretary to unload deliveries. Uh, the second one, um, as from another sec secretary talking about how she called the robot nasty names and told the robot that she would kick it in the camera if it said one more thing. Okay. On the other hand, the robot was not perceived as annoying at, at postpartum units. It was described as delightful. People referred to it as their buddy um, and that it's wonderful, their favorite, and referring to it more, uh, more with, their, with its social characteristics. Okay. So it's a very dramatic difference. So we can add this in our model again. We found that intimate social relationships uh, led to lower tolerance for interruptions and perceptions of the robot um, as disrupting the social, social dynamics of the robot. On the other hand, when social relationships were relaxed, uh, people perceived the robot more as a social entity and then tolerated some of these interruptions. Okay. So the last set of factors that I want to talk about is environmental. As I mentioned earlier, the units um, had almost, almost identical floor plans. Um, although frequent transfers and emergencies at the medical units caused heavy, tra heavy traffic and clutter in the hallways, including uh, life support units, beds, carts, and linen left around in the, in the hallways. Due to this high traffic and clutter, the robot got stuck. It collided with people and the equipment. And as you see in this expert, the informant is talking about how the robot almost ran her over and she got so mad because it hurt. With the heavy traffic and clutter and the, and the robot trying to navigate in the hallways, people perceived the robot as taking precedence over people, which led to feelings of mistreatment. And this expert excerpt, the informant is talking about how the robot doesn't have the manners that we teach our children that she finds it insulting that the robot takes precedence over patients who can barely walk uh, while she gives the precedence to the patients herself. Okay. Workers at the medical units perceive this clutter and, and robots getting in the way uh, also as hindering, uh, possibly hindering emergency work um, as they express in this example. She's saying, what a, what a concern if there's an emergency and we have, to, we have someone on a cart that we have to rush to the delivery room and is stuck here. 
or operation room, sorry. On the other hand, the traffic and clutter at the postpartum units was much less, which caused the robot to get stuck occasionally, but not at the same extent. More interestingly, people at the postpartum units attributed the delays caused by these problems to the senders of the deliveries, not to the robot. Okay. So in this, this excerpt, the informant is talking about how she calls the pharmacy for a drug delivery, and they wait and wait. And then she just doesn't understand why they can't just put the drugs in the robot and get them there. So she doesn't think that the, that the robot is de delaying the delivery, but attributing the delay to the people who send the delivery. Okay. And as a result of this perception, people at these units wanted the robots to be faster and more assertive, which is the opposite of what the other units wanted. Okay, so we can now add these findings to complete our theoretical model. We found that differences in patient profile affected the traffic and clutter in hallways. When traffic was high, the robot got stuck, um, collided with people and objects. People perceived themselves as having to give precedence to the robot. And when traffic was low, people wanted faster and more assertive robots. Okay. In summary, this work identified strong differences in how people used, perceived, and interacted with the robot, led by differences in workflow, social and emotional, political, and environmental factors. In particular, when people's workload was high, the robot perce was perceived as interrupting the, interrupting the workflow. When the benefits of using the robot were low, people rejected using the robot. Intimate relationships caused a lower tolerance for interruptions by the robot. And in high traffic or uh, cluttered hallways, the robot was perceived as taking precedence over people. Okay? So in addition to these findings, um, there are three main take-home messages from this study. First, we created new theory on how robots might impact the workplace. Okay? We can actually uh, go and experimentally test how uh, interruptions by technology might impact people's work and social interactions. So we can actually refine this theory further. Second, uh, this study also showed the importance of understanding the context of use. Uh, now, when we design technology uh, or a robotic product, we can actually ask ourselves, what are the current work practices in the context of use? How will the robot affect them? Does the robot help some but hinder others in the workplace? What are the social characteristics of the environment? How will the robot affect them? How does the, what does the physical environment affect? Um, how does the physical environment affected by the use of the robot? And what are possible breakdowns that could happen in this environment? The third aspect that we learn from the study is the need for designing appropriate behaviors for robots um, that have human-like features. We saw in the data that I presented um, that a lot of the breakdowns happened because the robot's behavior did not meet people's expectations. Right? It, it moved freely in, in hallways. It was given the capability to move freely in hallways and use human voice. Uh, but the actual appropriate social behavior that uh, has to support these features were not built into the system. Okay. Um, so if. Um, Oh, sorry, I just get confused here. There you go. OK. So if putting human-like features into robots raise expectations for, uh, for the appropriate social behavior to support these features, then the question is, how do we design these behaviors? And um, I'd like to use this question to shift gears here and move to the second part of the talk, um, where I'll be talking about how, how we can design such behaviors. Okay. All right. OK. So here, um, I would like to present a process um, that I adapted for designing social behavior and present two empirical studies that demonstrates how this process might be used uh, for designing particular design problems. And in this case, I'm going to focus on gaze. I'll talk more about this. So this, um, this work, the second part of the work, revolves around a central question. How can we harness knowledge on human behavior and social interaction to design more effective interactions for robotic systems? Okay. And to answer this question, there's a set of things that we need to know or a set of questions that we need to ask, um, such as what knowledge uh, we need to use from, from social and cognitive sciences in order to, to design these systems? What knowledge is missing here? 
How can we supplement existing knowledge with empirical data? How can we represent this understanding computationally so that robots can actually use them? And how to implement these systems into uh, these representations into systems? And finally, how do, how do we evaluate uh, the efficacy of these, of these design behaviors? So I try to answer this question, uh, this set of questions in an integrated interdisciplinary process of understanding, representation, implementation, and evaluation. And I'll explain what I mean by each. So given a design problem, say navigating in public, I first try to look at literature on social behavior to understand what theories might explain and predict this behavior. Okay? The theories provide a rough structure for the behavior that I'm trying to recreate. I then further specify the kinds of actions and triggers that are involved in this behavior by observing people in social situations, either in the lab or in public, and using uh, qualitative and quantitative microanalysis techniques to understand aspects of these behaviors. I then create computational models of this understanding in probabilistic frameworks. Uh, then these these models were converted into algorithms that a human-like robot can use to enact the behavior uh, specified by the model. Here it's important to note that uh, these are algorithmic implementations and not prescripted actions. Okay. And finally, um, I evaluate these implementations by creating experimental scenarios in which uh, naive participants are exposed to the design behavior. At this point, we go back to the original theories that we used and started with to design the behavior here uh, to understand how, um, what kind of manipulations we can introduce in the design behavior and what kind of social and cognitive benefits we can get out of these. Okay? And in these experimental scenarios, the robots produce the design behavior autonomously and most other aspects are controlled through Wizard of Oz techniques, meaning an operator is controlling them. Okay. So I'm going to uh, dem demonstrate how this process can be used to design social behaviors for a robot and focus on a particular aspect of social behavior and present two studies on gaze behavior. Okay. And I'll put this uh, mnemonic at the top so that with each study you can see where we're in the process. Okay. So in the work I'll present, I'll focus particularly on designing gaze behavior because gaze is a theoretically interesting aspect of human behavior. It's the main predictor of social attention. And if you remember the scene from the video, um, the, the robot doesn't really have an explicit gaze cue and people can't really tell which direction it's attending to, intending to go. And with gaze affordances, some of these breakdowns could have been avoided. And research on gaze also shows some physiological and neurological evidence that perception of gaze is somewhat automatic. Okay? So what you see here is a study showing the, the pupil dilation of an observer, observer in response to eye spot-like shapes. Okay? And you can see that the, the highest response is created uh, to uh, 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 shapes that are aligned like human eyes or, or any eyes. Okay? Oh, right. And this is a study. Uh, that was done by a previous CMU researcher, Kevin Pelfrey, showing responses in the brain to eye contact and averted gaze. So as you see in the picture on the right, um, we have mutual gaze and averted gaze. Th here, the mutual gaze, the eye contact, is actually creating greater activation than the averted gaze. Okay. And work on gaze also suggests that gaze behavior can provide social and cognitive benefits when used in particular ways. And this could lead to the development of applications that use great gaze to provide such benefits, such as improving learning or uh, facilitating social interaction. Okay. With robots, we have a unique opportunity to create uh, consistent, precise behaviors that can lead to such benefits. And this figure is from my work. Um, and the idea is that we can actually precisely align a robot's behavior to its speech and uh, I'll show more of this um, in the coming slides. What's also unique about robots, uh, of all social interactive systems from computer agents to robots, is that um, they provide the strongest social responses, or they evoke the so strongest social responses. So this work is done by Sarah Kiesler uh, in our lab, comparing robots and agents and people's evaluations of lifelikeness. And you can see that this monotonic decrease in ratings um, from an embodied robot to an on-screen agent, 
right? So this, this create, gives us this opportunity for, to use robots for social interaction. Okay. So the two studies that I'll present today will focus on two functions of gaze behavior, how gaze regulates uh, conversational roles and how it communicates intentions. And each study follows the research approach that I presented earlier. And they were, they were done in Japan with, with Japanese participants in Japanese language. So some of the audience can actually follow what's going on. <laughs> um, in the first study, I modeled the gaze behavior um, uh, of a speaker in different conversational structures. Uh, implemented this model on a human-like robot and evaluated uh, how aspects of conversation such as turn-taking, rapport, group formation might be affected by different, different conversation roles. And the second stu study, I modeled how people might give away information through gaze cues. Okay? I recreated this cue in two robots and uh, evaluated whether participants attributed intentionality to the gaze cue. So let's start with the first study. Um, in this study, we were looking at how gaze cues might be designed so that robots can carry out more fluent conversations, signaling the appropriate conversation roles to his partners. Okay? To, get it, to give you a better idea of what I mean by conversation roles, imagine this freeze-frame conversational situation. The core roles here are the roles of the speaker, and the addressee, who are active participants of the conversation, co-constructing the content of the conversation. There might also be side participants who are um, participants of the conversation but are not being addressed at that moment. Okay. And finally, there might be non-participants whose presences are acknowledged by the participants, such as bystanders, or those whose presences are not acknowledged by participants, such as overhears, eavesdroppers. So here I describe a freeze frame uh, conversational situation, but real conversations involve a complex regulation of roles. And gaze cues are thought to be instrumental in establishing these roles and renegotiating re them throughout the conversation. Okay. So the question that I wanted to answer here is, can a robot use these signals? And would they even work when they are produced by robots? And how can we design these signals um, to create effective communication? Okay. So there's some evidence uh, showing that they work when they're used by virtual agents. People have shown that uh, virtual agents can create appropriate um, responses and, and, and produce, produce appropriate uh, conversational functions when, uh, when, when they in interact with people. And also robot gaze is shown to perform certain conversational functions such as uh, producing back channel responses and so on. So, but not much is known about uh, whether uh, signaling uh, role signaling cues would work to actually um, establish conversation roles. Okay. okay, so as I described in the process, the first step in um, trying to create social behavior is to actually understand, try to get an understanding of the underlying behavioral mechanism. Okay. Um, the next three slides are a little dense, so if you have any questions, just feel free to ask and I'll repeat everything. Here, uh, we are talking about conversational gaze behavior to signal different participant roles. And, okay, so, and we're talking about Japanese language, and I conducted this study in Japan. Um, so some of the knowledge that we know in English might be different in, in Japanese, right? So we need to consider that too. So consider this uh, speech timeline, okay? We have a speaker speaking. We have addressees taking short turns and so and so. And at the top, you see uh, the gaze uh, behavior of the speaker as it maps at different targets, okay? Um, gazing toward the first address, the second address in the environment, and so and so. What we need to know um, in designing the, the gaze behavior is um, we would need to know the spatial and temporal properties of this behavior uh, for different conversation roles. So how much of this, these gaze shifts happen? Where, do, where are they targeted at? And how long do they take when the conversation roles change? Right. That's one of the variables that we need to identify. In addition to this, we need to uh, consider a number of conversational mechanisms, such as uh, gaze shifts that, that help manage turn exchanges. How do I give a person the turn to speak, and how does my gaze function in that? 
Also, uh, my gaze shifts are going to, uh, there, there will be gaze shifts taking place while I'm speaking. How do they take place? Okay. And finally, um, how do the gaze cues signal different conversation roles? Um, who am I giving what role in, and using what cue for this? Okay. And when we look at the literature, it actually provides um, almost no information about any of these. Um, <clears throat> so, so to better understand these aspects of conversational gaze, I asked naive participants to converse in three different conversational structures. So the first was a two-party conversation where we had a speaker, an addressee, and an overhearer behind the screen. Okay? Uh, in the second structure, we had a speaker, addressee, and a bystander. And the third structure, we had a speaker and two addressees. Okay. I captured the gaze behavior of all participants and coded for speech, gaze targets, and durations, and did a microanalysis of uh, the, all the mechanisms that I described earlier. Okay. So th this analysis produced a host of findings. But to, to keep things short, I'll be only talking about turn taking, the turn taking mechanism. And I'll be happy to describe you other ones if you're interested later. OK, so what you're seeing here is one question-answer pair uh, between the speaker and one of the addressees. So at the bottom, you see the speaker's speech, the addressee responding here. The gray areas are overlapping talk. Uh, the textured area is back-channel responses like uh-huh or nodding. Okay? And at the top, you see the gaze targets, the environment looking away, uh, addressees' faces, bodies for the two addressees. Okay. So in the analysis, we found that the majority of turn exchanges were managed using a sequence of four signals. Okay. The first signal is a floor holding signal where the speaker looks away sometime before the end of the question, signaling that he's not yet ready to pass the floor to his addressee. Okay. Toward the end of the question, he looks at his addressee that he's directing his question at, producing a turn yielding signal. Okay. And at the end of his addressee's response, he looks at, as he looks at his addressee, producing a turn-taking cue uh, that signals his availability to take the floor back. Okay. And once he takes the floor, he produces another floor-holding cue, signaling that uh, he has the floor now and doesn't want to be interrupted. Okay. So if we uh, want to see how a robot could do this, um, we see the, a, a little bit of a simplified version of the uh, timeline before. The robot will ask a question. Uh, the person will answer. The robot will create a minimum response, such as, oh, really? And then uh, keep on talking, OK? So if the robot followed that model that we found, it would first look away, producing a floor hold holding signal. Toward the end of his question, it will look at his addressee, producing a turn yielding signal. And after his addressee's response, uh, he, he will keep looking at his addressee, producing a turn-taking signal. And finally, once he take, takes the turn, he looks away, producing another floor-holding signal. Okay? So let's see this behavior in action. Okay? Um, here at the bottom, you see a more simplified version of the timeline, where we have one addressee. Um, I didn't put subtitles. This is in Japanese. I didn't put subtitles. But what the robot will say is, hello, my name is RoboV. What's your name? Waits for the answer. And it says, it's nice to meet you. And you can follow how the uh, signals are produced along the way. OK? The answer. Right. OK. So I integrated all these mechanisms, the ones that I didn't talk about too, into a fluent conversational gaze behavior and choreographed a scenario where uh, the robot played the role of a travel agent and gave information on uh, travel packages to two participants. Okay. I implemented an adaptive dialogue system in which the robot adapted the content of his, of his speech into the preferences of the, uh, of the participants. So it asked questions like, which country would you like to know about? And uh, based on the answer they got, the robot sort of adapted his speech. For the evaluation, uh, we designed uh, three between participant conditions. So in the first condition, the robot signaled the roles of a two-party conversation with an addressee and no one. So it treated this person as a single addressee, and this person was ignored. 
And the second condition, it was a two-party with a bystander uh, conversation. So this, this person is an advocacy, and the other one is a bystander. And the last one is a three-party conversation. Both parties, both uh, participants are treated equally as, as advocacies. Okay? We had 72 participants participate in this. Um, the one important thing to highlight here is that the participants were completely blind to the, to the conditions. Uh, all they knew was that we de developed a, a hospital, sorry, not hospital, um, a travel agent robot, and we would like to test the robot and need their help for that. So um, across the conditions, the robot's speech were, uh, were identical. We only had the gaze manipulation. Okay? Okay. And we created four hypotheses. First, uh, we wanted to see whether the mechanism would even work with robots. Right? So uh, we predicted that addresses would take more speaking turns and speak longer than people in other roles. Okay? The second prediction was that these individuals would also recall the information that the robot presented better because they're actively participating and actually co-constructing the conversation. The third hypothesis uh, predicted that participants who were acknowledged as either bystanders or addressees would like the robot more because they're properly acknowledged, right? Their presence is acknowledged. And finally, we hypothesized that addressees would feel more feelings of groupness with the robots um, and the individuals in, than the individuals in other roles. So I'll play a short clip from the experiment. <laughs> If you realize the, the robot asked the, the first person's name and then turned to the other one without actually asking, got an answer. It's actually showing how strong that gaze cue was, right? And that was like throughout common and common behavior. Okay, so let's look at the results now. Uh, the results show that participants in all roles conform to their roles 97% of the time, meaning that of the 100 turns that the robot passed, 97 were taken by the intended individual. Okay. As far as the statistical comparisons, the first hypothesis was that addresses would take more speaking turns, and this hypothesis was confirmed by both measures, so they take more speaking turns, and then also spoke longer than the other addresses. Okay. The second hypothesis was that addresses would have better recall of information presented by the robot. This was not confirmed. Um, but we, and we found no effect here, but what we found was more task attentiveness. So advocacies said that they attended to the task more. Um, this is somewhat confusing because if you're attending to the task more, you should be performing better. But one possible explanation to see the attentiveness effect but not the performance effect is the adaptive dialogue. So the robot asked uh, people which, you know, which, what kind of information they want to hear. So they're more likely to pick something that they're either interested in or they know more about. So I think that created a confound. And in fact, when we looked at it, the topic that they chose had a significant effect on, on recall, uh, meaning that, that that somehow created a confound. OK, so uh, the third hypothesis predicted that addresses and bystanders would like the robot more than overhearers did. So this was confirmed. Even that simple acknowledgement as a bystander actually led to more liking. Okay. And finally, we predicted that addresses would feel stronger feel feelings of groupness than others. This hypothesis was also confirmed. Those who participated in the conversation as active participants felt more welcome than valued by the group. OK, so now if we go back to the scenario that I presented earlier, we can tell that we know how a robot should, should uh, behave to establish the roles of its conversational partners. Right. OK, so I'm going to talk about the second study. It's a little shorter. So in this first study, we looked at more explicit gaze cues that uh, have a particular meaning, uh, like that robot turning and getting the name of the other participant. Okay? And in the second study, uh, we want to look at gaze cues that are subtler and can provide information on the intentions and mental states of, of an individual. Okay? So to, to place this idea in context, uh, let's consider the situation where we have two friends playing a game of guessing. Okay? They sit across. Um, each other and lay out whatever they find in their backpacks on a the table. 
And one person plays the role of the picker, the other plays the role of the guesser. Um, the, the picker looks at the items and, and guesses one of the, the items, uh, sorry, picks one of the items. And the guesser asks questions to the picker uh, that he can answer yes or no um, and guess the item. Okay? What's interesting for my exploration, the situation is that the guesser, in addition to the verbal responses that, that she guessed to her questions, will automatically look for signs in the, guess, uh, and, in the picker's nonverbal behaviors for signals that could give away information about the, the picker's mental states. Okay? So the kinds of nonverbal cues that I'm describing here are called nonverbal leakages that people produce automatically due to changes in, in mental or emotional states. So what's more interesting thing is, is that observers automatically search for these cues and interpret them in a consistent way. Okay? And gaze cues are particularly uh, communicable mental states, uh, or what is called the theory of mind, the ability to attribute intentionality or beliefs to others. So the question that we are interested in here is uh, whether people can attribute intentionality to a robot if we use these cues, and how can we create these cues? What, where do we look at first? Okay. And some work has been done uh, with agents related to this family of cues, but um, not, nothing was done on, on gay cues at least, and on robots either. Okay. So to get a better understanding of this mechanism, we asked participants to play the game that I described earlier and conducted a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the picker's gay cues. Okay. So I'm going to show you a video of how the picker uh, answered one of the questions of the, of the guesser and how he leaked information. So he's going to first receive, an receive a question and then answer the question. And I want you to pay attention to what happens in between. So he receives a question. And then answers. Right? So there was this really quick glance at the item that it picked. Uh, he, he did to, to, to be able to answer the question. And this was a very common behavior overall. This uh, particular uh, participant actually produced this 22 times in an eight session game. Okay, very common behavior. Okay, so now we can actually take these glances and model the kinds of movements that happen and also the, the temporal and spatial properties of that movement and create a model that robots can, can act on. Okay. So it's an abstract representation of the model. Here the robot answer, uh, receives a question from the guesser, and it answers it. And in between, uh, from the task space, it glances at the object, and then uh, builds eye contact and answers the question. Okay? And this is how this will look in action. And I'm going to show it in, in two robots. Okay? First with Geminoid. So he receives the, the, answer, the question and answers it. Okay? Now this will be with the queue, receives a question. Right. Answers. Okay. This is the other robot without the queue. And with the queue. Question. <laughs> right. Okay. So to see whether people can actually attribute any intentionality to that, to that cues, we created an experimental situation where participants played the game that we use for our modeling. So in the game, the robots played the role of the picker, and the, the participants were the, were the guesser. Okay? And they played uh, eight sessions of the robots as a repeated trials. And this was a both between and within participants design experiment. The between participants manipulation was that uh, participants either played with Geminoid or RoboV, uh, the within participants was that in eight sessions, in four of them, the robot produced a queue, so it looked at the item, and the other four it didn't, and this was randomly distributed. We had 26 participants do the, uh, the experiment. Okay. So we created two hypotheses. The first hypothesis predicted that participants would read the leakage queue, infer that the robot is looking at his pick, use this information in the task, and show better performance in, in the game, meaning that they will find the item in less time or by asking uh, a small number of questions. The second hypothesis predicted that the effect would be stronger with Geminoid uh, because of its highly human-like uh, appearance. We predicted that um, the robot's extremely human-like appearance would provide better affordances for this very human-like cue. Okay. So let's look at what the task looked like. So this is Geminoid. The person is asking the question. The robot answers it. This is with RoboV. 
and the robot answers the question. Right. Okay. So the first prediction was that the leakage queue would lead to better performance. This um, was confirmed by the results. So in, in both measures of performance, number of questions and time. And here, low scores is better performance. Uh, so people ask less questions and found item in, in less time when the robot glanced at the object. Okay? And this data is for both robots. So let's look at the per robot data now. The second hypothesis predicted that the effect would be larger with Gemini than with RoboV. The results were somewhat uh, confirmed, uh, the hypothesis. So the effect on participant performance was significant with uh, Gemini, but not with RoboV. Okay, so this difference was significant, but this wasn't. And more interestingly, when participants were asked whether they recall seeing anything in the robot's behavior that helped them find its pick, they were significantly less likely to recall the cue with Gemini than with RoboV. Okay. Even though their behavior is affected, they are not recalling it. Okay. Uh, and this is suggesting uh, that they might be reading it automatically, responding to it automatically, not actually recalling it. And I want to show you a video of one of these question answer pairs to see, to show what the, the participant behavior was like. Okay. So here the participant asks the question, okay. the robot glances, and the first thing that the participant does is glance at that location. And when you ask these participants, they actually don't recall this. Um, the results also showed that participants actually performed better with RoboV when the, even when the robots did not produce the cure. And this was somewhat confusing, but we found that the, the main reason for this is that with Geminoid, people were much less comfortable. They rated the robot uh, less significantly desirable. Um, and I think there are some of the some of the uncanny valley effects might be playing here. Uh, when we look at the data for each gender, we actually see that males did not have a preference across robots, but females liked the uh, found geminoid much less uh, social desirable than they found RoboV. Okay. Um, and uh, in fact, some of the female participants also reported in the interviews uh, that we did at the end of the experiment that they were uncomfortable with geminoid. Um, and this actually shows in their ratings too. Okay. So one more last result that I want to highlight uh, that I find very interesting is that um, we found an effect of the interaction effect between gaze queue and pet ownership. So people who own pets were the only ones who were affected by the gaze queue, right? And non-pet owners were not affected. And this is somewhat consistent with literature that suggests that people who own pets are more likely to be socially sensitive. And also, the, the process of training your pet actually makes you more sensitive to understanding or interpreting social behavior. And this actually led to a grant proposal that we just submitted. And it's kind of an interesting uh, area of research. Okay. So, um, we learned in the study that with simple cues, robots can communicate mental states and emotional states. And we can design these cues by looking at how people use them in real, real life. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to close by summarizing some of the high level conclusions from this work. Okay. One of the things that we learned um, in the work that I presented in the first part of the talk is that ethnographies are, are great tools for understanding social environments and, people, and how people function in these environments. In human-robot interaction research, it's essential to establish a, a long-term understanding of the social context in which robots do and will function. I also think that long-term detailed qualitative analyses of social phenomena allows for establishing the theoretical foundations of a research area, and human-robot interaction could uh, significantly benefit from this approach. In the work that I presented in the second part of the talk, we showed that by carefully designing social behaviors for robots, we can provide people with social and cognitive benefits. In particular, we showed that with simple manipulations in the gaze behavior, we can get uh, higher conversational participation, heightened task attentiveness, stronger rapport and feelings of groupness, and better test performance led by stronger interpretations of mental states. Okay. So lastly, I would like to list some of the outstanding issues with both lines of research. Uh, first of all, the goal of ethnographies is to explain complex social phenomena and, the, and their outcomes uh, can't be used directly as predictive models. Okay. 
The, the findings need to be refined through, through field or lab experiments. Um, for instance, in the model that I created in the first, study, uh, first part of the talk, uh, to really understand the relationship between interruptibility and robot use, we might want to conduct um, lab studies focusing on this relationship and testing different aspects um, of this relationship. Second, uh, modeling human behavior, particularly social behavior, is extremely costly. Um, and I think that this part of the work could be um, could significantly benefit from automatic proce processing using uh, computer vision and machine learning techniques. And lastly, um, this work so far has focused on designing behavioral mechanisms without actually considering the, the cognitive mechanisms and also the, the input in real time uh, that it could get from people. Right? Ideally, we would like to combine social and cognitive mechanisms and consider uh, real time input in generating social behaviors. Okay. And um, these are some of the directions that, that I hope to um, look into in the, in the future. Okay, so this concludes my talk. I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, I think I would claim so. I actually said in one of the categories that um, the robot was perceived as a disruption to the social environment in the medical units. And when, uh, when the postpartum units referred to the, the robot, they actually referred to its, its social capabilities, such as they talked about its voice and they actually wanted to uh, you know, put something like a Barry White voice on it and you know, wanted to record one of the nurse's husband's noise voice and, and use that and so on. So, so I think there was a lot of um, um, considerations in the social dimensions in terms of um, you know, accepting the robot as a part of the social environment and thinking about you know, how, how they could integrate it even more or um, how they could um, perceive or they do perceive in, in different ways. And in the medical units, it was really this utility that just didn't function for them. And this was a particularly disruptive kind of utility because um, when you're thinking about other forms of technology, say um, you know, patient monitors, they don't come to you and they don't come to you and interrupt you in the middle of your work, right? This is a, this is a very unique form of technology that goes to people, that interrupts people on their way, and so on and so forth. It has the potential to do so. So I think um, that aspect is really important in terms of both creating that social um, sense of presence and also for the disruption for the environment. It's, it's not obvious to be a disruptiveness per se, though it would lead to calling it dead. Just like, for example, one of our medical students are often very disruptive. They're perceived as right. something that intrudes upon normal workflow. And yet, uh, in most medical environments, we're still referring to medical students. Hmm. Right. I think that idea that you know they're thinking of it as a utility, and, and the other uh, um, in the other environment, they're, they're thinking of it as a social entity. Um, yeah, I mean, most, most of the transcripts really refer to different social characteristics of, of the robot. Um, like I said, it's the voice, it's the uh, how they um, sort of um, sometimes put like, you know, like um, little things on the robot so that it can annoy the next unit and, and things like that. So, so thinking about the different social implications of using the robot. Right. Can blink, but the right. That's um, so. I think that the physical design generally has a big impact, and I think of blinking as as a part of the physical design, uh, because um, if Geminoid didn't blink, it would it would look unnatural. So we had to put the blinking there, right? So I, I feel that that's sort of the if the affordances are there, the behavior has to be there. So it's a part of sort of the design. And also, uh, if I'm asked to 
play at the same task, I would rather move my eyes to the uh, different direction. I mm -hmm. don't. I try not to look at the object that I selected, but I try not to see my object. Right. So did you also? So we you? saw two kinds of behaviors, and we adapted one of them. One was that they would just quickly glance, either before they answered the question or after they answered the question, to make sure that their answer was correct. Right? And this is a really fast glance. And I, I think that the actual person producing that thinks that it's not seen. You know, it's just a just quick thing I did. The second kind of behavior was that they actually did glance to the object, but they also glanced to another object to conceal that. Right? So we actually follow, uh, followed up on that, and we did a follow-up study to that second study I presented, where we had a third condition where the robots actually tried to conceal. And that actually uh, didn't lead to the same performance uh, effect as the second condition, as the, uh, the leakage con condition created. Yeah, so there are definitely different um, techniques that people came up with when they were playing it. Right, I think that's one of the effects. Although Geminoid's eyes also created some noise, I couldn't hear it much, but um, there was definitely more noise there. What, um, like here, you see that, you know, that people are more likely to recall, but what's interesting is that even though they recall it, it doesn't affect their performance as significantly as it does in the other one. And uh, some of the responses from the, in, uh, the interviews was that, People said that they actually saw the behavior, but they couldn't make much meaning out of it. So they might be thinking, oh, the robot is broken, or um, you know, there are a lot of attributions they can make. And we were actually really surprised to even see that effect with Geminoids. Uh, because it's this really human-like thing that you would you know, automatically attribute, and you would use that information in your task. This, this real automatic, fast process happening it's actually surprising that it works with a robot at all, even though it looks like a real human. Well, you didn't consider intonation at all when with the turn-taking task, mm -hmm. but don't you think it's, um, it's still very important um, the way people end their sentences? Because we know um, how to do with turn-taking on the telephone when we don't mm -hmm. see any days at all. Right. And so I think um, you had some variation in the way the, the robot speaks in the turn-taking mm -hmm. task. So we so the, the the part that I showed is only one of the mechanisms. We had several mechanisms in there, and one of them considered the the uh, gaze um, patterns during speech. So if I'm saying a long utterance in that utterance, I'm still going to move my gaze. And how do I do that? So we found different patterns uh, in the way that people did it and implemented all that too. We didn't consider intonations there. Um, what was um, interesting, I think, is you know the difference between the phone and the face-to-face -face interaction is you saw in that data that there is a lot of um, overlap at the question-answer pairs. And let me pull that up right now. Um, yeah, you can see that here. There is a lot of overlap between the answer and the question, and I think that's partly because of the gaze cue. They get the turn-taking signal much early. They know the turn is coming. Even though the intonation is not complete, they can answer. And the phone, on the phone, you mostly um, you know, anticipate a little bit, but there is mostly less overlapping talk. Oops. So um, yeah, I think, I think that would be important. There's no power on this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, OK. Could you also explain about how this There you go. Sorry. Yep. How the behavior to look away from the subject to looking at the environment affected the interaction. So the robot looked at not only their partner, but also sometimes the wall or something. Right. How did it affect? So what we were trying to do there is we tried to 
create the most human-like model that we can by looking at the human data. And that involved looking at you know, different places throughout the talk and, um, um, and also how that was aligned with speech. For example, before, when they started a particular utterance, uh, most at the beginning of the utterance, people looked away, sort of kind of like thinking about it, and then they looked at, but then they didn't want to look at too much, so they looked down. So you see this pattern of, pattern of looking away, looking at, looking down throughout the data. And our goal there was to create that sort of natural uh, patterns of gaze. Um, so we weren't comparing whether the robot was looking away or not. We were trying to create the most natural pattern, and on top of that, test whether we can manipulate uh, people's roles uh, with, the, with the cues that we found in the data. Actually, from the movies, I got the impression that the, this behavior is not so natural. So, as I understand the Japanese language, and then it is not really much this gay behavior. So it's rather unnatural. Are you talking about the first video with the? Uh, when the robot first looked at somewhere else, and then mm -hmm. that is so I think you, you, you may be getting that impression because of the robot's appearance. When we, pr like, when, if you record my data and actually analyze it, you would see that I'm doing things like that all the time, looking up and down. Um, I think the, the behavior of the robot and the appearance have different levels of human likeness. So when you see it looking away, it kind of looks odd. Mm -hmm. Like had it been on Gemini, it probably wouldn't be as yeah. unnatural as you're saying. About the, this issue of natural misalignment uh -huh. behavior. Um, so that the timing of the robot gazes appear to be longer than the timing of the corresponding human gaze. Um, the, 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 the duration of the, the duration of the gaze, and also the, the acceleration profile looks different. So the eyes are sort of smoothly accelerating away instead of going on a more ballistic trajectory, which is typical of psychosis. So that leads me to the following question, which is, in terms of trying to get natural looking behavior, to what extent are the, um, the mechanics of the, the physical capabilities versus the, the link of the motion with the semantics of, of the conversation? Right. Where, where's the trade-off there? Well, I think there is a big trade-off because if you actually try to create gaze behavior, what you find is that robots can't do saccades, right? There's there's the delays, the the motor, um, you know, startups are, are just just too slow. So um, what we also found in that second study, the glances that the human participants produce were too short for the robot to actually produce them. So we had to add a baseline delay to every cue, right? And had it been exactly like how humans did, maybe the, the results would be stronger. Uh, because it's the, f I think it's the speed, the fastness of that motion that kind of catches your eye and that you understand what's going on and interpret that all automatically. So I think you know, the, um, the platforms, the robots, should try to sort of match human capabilities at some point in order to really match the human behavior. but. Um, I think until that's, that's done, we'll need to uh, find a sweet spot there where the behavior is natural or proceed as natural, and um, we, we can, our platform can still do that. And I think that could be done through like sort of micro studies as, you know, have the delays at different speeds and, you know, and then see what, what is rated as most, na most natural. So I'm going to interject here. I'm sure there's still more questions. Feel free to come up afterwards and, and uh, uh, ask our speaker these questions. I'll be here. Um, thank you for coming. I know it's a beautiful day right before spring break. So go out there and enjoy it. And uh, the seminar series will be back in two weeks. Two weeks. Sounds right to me. Yeah, sounds right. OK. See, it's already spring break in my mind. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.